start. So today I'm pleased to introduce Jessica Glazer, who will be talking about Beatrice Ward, May Lambert and Becker, and Books Across the Sea. I'll now hand over to Jessica in a few minutes, where I would just like to just like to say, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and Jessica will be able to answer them at the end of the session. Jessica, now over to you. Thank you, Depisha. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jessica Glazer. I'm Senior Lecturer in Graphics at the University of Wolverhampton, and I have a special research interest in Beatrice Ward. And in my presentation today, I'm going to introduce you to Beatrice Ward, briefly explain her importance. I'm going to go on to discuss her mother, May Lambert and Becker, one of the most significant influences in Beatrice's life and work, and then um, go on to analyze and explain a little bit about one of their most notable joint achievements, the Anglo-American um, book exchange, Books Across the Sea. The circumstances of Beatrice's life are important to understanding her achievements and developments in printing during the late 19th and 20th century increased interest in type and typography. And as a result, Beatrice emerged as a notable commentator whose work in the 20th century stood apart from that of others, creating debate, enhancing understanding, framing and expanding discussion in this subject and creating a legacy that's impacted 21st century typography and design. Beatrice Ward was publicity director of the Monotype Corporation. She was a typographic scholar, an educator, a theoretician and a, with an international reputation. She devoted herself to spreading ideas about good typography to the widest possible audiences with astonishing results. Beatrice understood communications and its workings and this was manifest in her interests in type, in printing, in language, marketing, public relations, politics, communication generally and education. In her obituary, the Times referred to her as the first lady of typography and there were many other amazing accolades that were afforded to her. But my favourite, which I'd like to share with you today, was um, the Queen of Type. Beatrice was actually crowned the Queen of Type um, in the 1950s by the Atlanta Printing Group, who invited her to come and talk and they planned and staged a coronation. She was made the queen of typography. She gave her speech um, and they also had um, the coronation followed by the opportunity to have autographs signed by Beatrice Ward. She was born in New York in 1900. She was the only child of May Lambert and Becker and Gustav Becker. He was a composer and an acclaimed musician. And here we have um, a very lovely family photo from around 1902. And it looks like a very happy scene. This photograph comes from the Cadbury Research Library, the Beatrice Ward collection. And I'm very grateful to the Cadbury Research Library for allowing me to share these images with you today. This looks like a very happy scene. I think it probably wasn't quite so happy because by 1908, her parents' marriage had ended. Um, Beatrice's father um, went on to remarry and to have a second family. And Beatrice was brought up by her mother and widowed grandmother. Ward's mother provided for her family and was a popular and well-connected literary figure, writing for newspapers, magazines, giving lectures, authoring books and undertaking freelance writing projects. Her work appeared in publications including the New York Evening Post, the Times Literary Supplement and the New York Herald Tribune, where Lambert and Becker's Reader's Guide, a column, ran for 40 years and where she advised on choice of reading material, providing book reviews and recommendations. In 1922, the then Beatrice Becker married Frederick Ward and apologies for kind of jumping on through Beatrice's early life here just to kind of summarise. Um, 
this is Frederick Ward, who was also a very eminent figure and who he became a very eminent figure in the world of printing. Unfortunately, the Ward's marriage didn't last, but I think Beatrice um, retained a very fond spot for, for Frederick. Um, she kept his photograph. This, I think, was a very cherished photograph. She obviously kept it in a special frame and she's written on the reverse of it as well. Ward's career had begun as an assistant librarian at the American Type Founders Library before she moved to Britain in 1925 and where she ultimately became the publicity manager for the Monotype Corporation in 1929. And for over 30 years, she edited the Monotype Recorder and the Monotype Newsletter. So Monotype made printing and composing equipment, they designed and sold typefaces and they were one of the most important organisations um, in that area of work in Britain at the time. And this is Beatrice in the 1920s when she had not long been in Britain, had her hair cut, um, embraced a kind of new independent lifestyle in a brand new city. Her career provided a unique opportunity for her to focus her interests in typographic theory and further what she described as the only subject that interested her, the nature and behaviour of the human mind. Ward was well connected, having through a network of colleagues, friends and relations, links to areas including lit literature, printing, typography, education, the arts, politics, religion and science. The most influential to Ward was her mother, May Lamberton Becker, and I have a picture of her from the 1930s. And May Lamberton Becker provided her with professional support, emotional support and financial help as well. And that extended throughout their lives. May Lamberton Becker died in 1958. Um, so it was throughout Ward's working life that she supported her. She also facilitated many of Ward's professional connections, including helping her achieve that first um, place of employment at the American Type Founders Library, where she met Eminent, indi em eminent individuals from the printing world, including Stanley Morrison, the British typographer and scholar who helped to develop Beatrice's scholarly interest in printing history and her career in Britain. And here we have some images of Beatrice with Stanley Morrison. Um, on the left, that's in 1958, and Beatrice has just returned from some extensive tours of Australia and South Africa. And the one on the right, I think, is from the 1930s. Ward also had an influential and long lasting friendship with the British educational psychologist Sir Cyril Burt. And we have a photograph of her here from around 1960. She corresponded daily with Sir Cyril from around 1954 until her death in 1969. And through him, she developed an understanding of psychology and type. Another influential figure um, to Beatrice Ward was Paul Beaujean. And Paul Beaujean was a fictitious persona she constructed and the pseudonym under which she wrote independently, enabling her to establish a career and reputation in the male dominated profession outside the realms of monotype. Now, I don't have a photograph of Paul Beaujean to share with you, but I do have um, a rather beautiful certificate from the Cadbury Research Library. And this certificate is from the American Embassy um, in 1926. And it is a certificate that is vouching for the identity of Beatrice Ward. It is saying that Beatrice Lambert and Becker Ward, unfortunately spelt incorrectly here without the E, um, ha uses the pen name of Paul Beaujean. Now, I don't know for sure what she was using the certificate for. I speculate that it might have been for opening bank accounts, for example, but it could also have perhaps been used to facilitate access to archives and other areas that might have been perhaps male dominated environments and she needed to prove her credentials um, for want of a better phrase. May Lambert and Becker understood publishing and the importance of communication with print, interests that she passed on to Ward. 
She was an important figure. She had status and influence in America and was respected overseas, using her power and connections and affluence for the benefit of her daughter. And all of these facts kind of um, have greater relevance when we start talking about Books Across the Sea and how that was founded. Beatrice and Lambert and Becker were friends and colleagues of T.S. Eliot. And when Lambert and Becker died, T.S. Eliot made a speech um, referring to Lambert and Becker, and he described her as a woman of immense energy, uh, a keen mind and wide interests. I suppose she knew nearly everybody worth knowing in New York in the field of literary, literary journalism and journalism in general. But she obviously had much wider connections than that. And he went on to imply that she had connections in politics um, and government in the States and was able to exert her influence as a result of those links. And T.S. Eliot was making this speech at the opening of the May Lambert and Becker Memorial Reading Room in 1955. Beatrice spoke at this event, as, as did Eliot here. And you can see him in this photograph um, making the speech where that quote comes from. And to kind of bring more up to date um, an idea of, of Lambert and Becker's power, in a 2006 publication, Every Book Its Reader, The Power of the Printed Word to Stir the World by Nicholas Baspains, he describes, he goes into detail describing the work of some eminent literary professionals who perhaps have lost prominence um, in recent years. And the first person he has in his book is Lambert and Becker. And he describes her as the Oprah Winfrey of her day and in an institution. So that kind of gives you an idea of her power and influence. And we have um, a very nice photograph of, of mother and daughter, again, I think from the 1930s. Lambert and Becker had expertise in public relations. She offered career advice to her daughter and within and from America successfully promoted Ward's work. This is recorded because from 1925 till 1955, living in different countries, Lambert and Becker and Ward corresponded. Time and importantly distance were the main reasons for their extensive detailed letter writing. They shared thoughts and intimacies that had they been living more closely would have been left unrecorded. And as a result, we are able to create a comprehensive sense of their everyday lives within the culture and society in which they each lived. Lambert and Becker and Ward had political interests and connections. And at the outbreak of World War II, within a London-based American expat organization, the American Outpost, founded to counter Nazi propaganda and inform America about what was happening in London, they established Books Across the Sea. So this is the Books Across the Sea logo. Um, this was actually designed in the 1950s rather than um, at the outbreak of war. Beatrice Ward loved a logo. Um, she liked having different elements that she could promote um, her endeavours with and a logo was really useful. But the circumstances of the founding of Books Across the Sea are quite interesting. And in a letter to the Times newspaper, a friend of Beatrice's, Professor Arthur Newell, who was the first president of Books Across the Sea, he responded to her obituary in the Times in 1969, and he reflected on the circumstances of the founding of Books Across the Sea, describing Ward rushing into his office at the American outpost and saying, words to the effect of, you have to do something, we have to do something. Commercial shipping between Britain and America is no longer allowed as a result of the Battle of the Atlantic, which means that people in both countries won't be able to read about each other. Books won't pass between the two countries and we need to do something in order to make sure that misconceptions don't start to develop. The nucleus of books across the sea was a gift of 70 new American books unpublished in Britain and chosen by Lambert and Becker and sent by her as a gesture of encouragement to a group of American and British friends wanting to enrich knowledge of the real America. American book enthusiasts took part in a nationwide correspondence on which their choice of titles was based. 
Lambert and Becker was able to receive suggestions through her newspaper columns, which were syndicated throughout America. The arrival of these books in London attracted widespread interest. And by the end of 1941, the Fuchs first books across the sea circle. So they called their groups circles. And the first books across the sea circle was formed in London and was inundated with requests for loans from a collection that had quickly grown to 700 items. And this was their first reading room. And this was part of the offices that the American outpost had been lent and it was in a barrister's chambers in central London and they had displays, themed displays of books. There were also labels on some of these books telling you how they were printed. Um, do notice the kind of, I think it's bomb damage in the top left hand corner that's visible. This will become a little bit relevant um, later in my presentation, but I'm pretty sure there's, there's bomb damage up there. Now this reading room was accessible by members of, of the society and by people who were interested who could come and have a look at these books. And always these books were the only version of that book in Britain at the time. A corresponding books across the sea circle was established in New York so that what became known as ambassador books could pass both ways across the Atlantic. Private transatlantic shipping was impossible during wartime and each volume had to be carried within the limited luggage of friends of books across the sea who had passage between Britain and America. So some of these were in luggage and occasionally they were posted as well. So the postal service was used as well as the reading room. Um, they used these offices to stage um, exhibitions and this is a 1944 exhibition of children's books so they weren't just books for adults there were books for children as part of the collection and this was a really popular 1944 exhibition and at the back there there's Beatrice Ward wearing a hat staring right at the photographer okay I I'm pretty certain that the five early aims of the organisation were written by Beatrice Ward and they certainly reflect her interest in type, in printing and publishing as well as her tone of voice. Now I'm not going to read all of these aims out to you today but there are a couple of things I would like to highlight and there is one that I will aim. The things that I'd like to highlight are in, in the second aim um, and she's talking about books being used as goodwill emissaries, so fostering goodwill and understanding between the two countries um, and therefore countering Nazi propaganda and Nazi efforts to divide. But she is also weaponizing books in, in this aim. She's referring to them as warriors and she goes on to talk about books as weapons. And that was quite a well used phrase by quite a number of people at this time. But I'm wondering whether Beatrice Ward might have been one of the first people to describe books as weapons during wartime. And I think I'd like to read through the, the fourth aim because it's one of the one of the aims that particularly um, references printing um, and printing history, which what is what leads me to believe that Beatrice Ward has either written these aims or had um, a very significant role in writing these aims. So the fourth aim, she's saying to bring together faithful friends of books from all the different provinces of that realm so that publishers, librarians, educationalists, authors, booksellers, printers, proofreaders, typographic designers and all others who owe their livelihood to Cadmus and Gutenberg may join hands with layman book lovers in the defence of their one common heritage of literature in the English language. The exchange fulfilled what Ward and Lambert and Becker saw as a long-standing need. With newly arrived books first circulating amongst books across the sea members who would report on their value as ambassadors with a view to them becoming part of the collection and they had book receptions in some of the elite London hotels and they would 
um, have these receptions, they would put together lists of books for consideration about four times a year and they would have these public book receptions that um, discussed and presented the titles. They were two or three minutes long, these presentations were, before deciding on which titles um, should be recommended and sent. Beatrice Ward and her mother were um, very skilled in public relations and one of the areas that they were expert in was choosing networks of people to support books across the sea very much in the way that we would have brand ambassadors or influencers today they had honorary councillors and they had groups of honorary councillors quite extensive groups in britain and in america and i thought now would be a good point to kind of share some of those um, individuals with you. So on the left, we have um, a very short list of some of the honorary councillors um, in Britain. So the second president I've already mentioned was T.S. Eliot. And the first person on this little list that I have se um, selected is Professor D.W. Brogan. And he was a Scottish author and historian. He was Professor of Political Science at Cambridge University, and interestingly star of the Transatlantic Quiz, a BBC radio programme founded in 1944 that exchanged questions between teams in London and New York with the aim of testing the team's knowledge of the other country and also fostering good will and understanding between the two countries. The second person is John Hadfield. Now, he was an author, a publisher during wartime. He was the book officer for the British Council. The third is Walter Harrop, who was director of George G. Harrop, an Australian printing company. Um, he, all, he also and several other British printing, binding and distribution companies. During wartime, he was the president of the Publishers Association. Walter Lewis, who was Cambridge University printer between 23 and 45. Humphrey Milford, who was editor and publisher to the University of Oxford and head of the London operations of Oxford University Press. Sir Thomas More MP, who was a Scottish unionist politician. The Honourable Harold Nicholson MP, who was a diplomat, a writer, a politician. He was married to Vita Sackville West. He was Labour MP for Leicester West and during wartime was on the Board of Governors for the BBC. And in the late 1930s, he was one of the few MPs to alert the country to the threat of fascism. And Nicholson was friend and colleague to many politicians, including Winston Churchill, Ramsay MacDonald and Anthony Eden. The next person on this list is um, the Honourable Sir Malcolm Robertson, who was Conservative MP for Mitcham and Chairman of the British Council. And he was also the first secretary to the, he had been the first secretary to the British Embassy in Washington. Rebecca West, who was a very well-known and respected British author, journalist, literary critic and travel writer. West reviewed books for newspapers, including the New York Herald Tribune, which is how I think she was connected with May Lambert and Becker and Beatrice Ward, um, because obviously May Lambert and Becker's column was within the New York Herald Tribune. And then finally in Britain, um, from this selection, we have Mrs. Beatrice Wright MP, who is an American-born British politician and conservative MP for Bodmin. So on the American side of this list, the selection I've, I've picked includes Mr. Raymond Bond, who was publisher, editor, um, and director of advertising and promotions and ultimately president of Dodd Mead Publishers. And they were May Lambert and Becker's publisher. Mr. and Mrs. Merrill Dennison. Mr. Merrill Dennison was a Canadian playwright and pioneer of radio drama. Mrs. Merrill Dennison was an author of children's books and writer under the pseudonym of Frances Newton. Um, and she published in um, locations including This Week and in the Reader's Digest. Sir Angus Fletcher, who was director of the British Library of Information in New York and chairman of the United Nations Headquarters Commission. There were quite a few people who were honorary councillors who were linked to um, the United Nations. 
Mr. Howard Haycroft, who was publishing executive, author and editor of H.G. Wilson Company, publishers of library reference books. And during, during World War II, he was in the US Army Special Services and he had responsibility for troop education and recreation. Miss Flora B. Luddington, American librarian and author from 1953 to 54, she became president of the American Library Association. And Luddington also worked on post-war rehabilitation of European libraries. Frederick Melcher, who was an American publisher and bookseller, he was a major contributor to library science and the book industry, and also known for his contribution to children's books. He was a Unitarian like Ward and Lambert and Becker, and from 1946 he provided books across the sea with its New York headquarters. He was also helpful to May Lambert and Becker in making that initial selection of 70 books from all of those suggested by her readers. Miss Jan Struther, um, a very well-known English writer um, who developed a character, Mrs. Miniver, which um, she initially appeared as a column in the Times newspaper and Mrs. Miniver became incredibly popular in America. She was an ordinary British woman living during wartime and in America um, Struthers published um, a book on Mrs. Miniver and also in 1942 a film was made which won six Academy Awards. Struther also wrote a number of very popular hymns including Lord of All Hopefulness. Um, Hendrik Willem van Loon as well was a Dutch American historian and journalist, an award winning children's author. His work was banned from Germany but gained popularity um, and respect for, from Franklin D. Roosevelt, on whose 1940s presidential campaign van Loon worked. At this stage, I probably should show you um, some of the titles that they exchanged, that they, they sent to America from the, the British Books Across the Sea Circle. And I've picked some from 1945. As I mentioned previously, um, they compiled lists of books about four times a year. And this is the March 1945 selection. They were reviewing 92 titles at that particular book reception on topics including poetry, politics, European relations, arts, fiction, planning, development, education, uh, natural history, local government and children's books. And the common feature with all of these books, they couldn't have been published in the other country. So these books were published in Britain, they weren't available in America. And um, they had to have been published in the preceding 12 months. And there are titles here by Dylan Thomas, George Orwell, um, The Lid Lifts by Patrick Gordon Walker um, was a report on the liberation of Belson. Um, and Gordon Walker was in 1945 elected the Labour MP for Smethwick in, in the Midlands. Um, there were books on art, on education, we had government reports, local government reports as well. And then at the end of this list, we've got a children's book, um, which is by Edith Marks. So there's quite a diverse selection of subjects that they were sending, um, sending to America. As a more personal way of exchanging cultural understanding, in 1941, within Books Across the Sea, Warden Lambert and Becker established a scrapbook exchange. And this is an image of some of their scrapbooks, which was published in the Outpost newsletter um, with some amazing hand rendering and image making on the covers. Um, Initially made by adults and children, books were said to vividly portray the day-by-day -day scenes of life at home and at school and on national holidays. In 1940, by 1945, the scrapbooks were popular and in conjunction with Messrs Roy Publishers in New York, the two Books Across the Sea Societies held an annual competition for the best school scrapbook written and compiled by what was called Juvenile Ambassadors and the winner was going to be published. There were also plans to exhibit scrapbooks in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. The children's scrapbooks helped Ward and Lambert and Becker publicise Books Across the Sea. 
They used quotes designed to stir emotions and elicit, elicit support for their cause. And there are a number of quotes that they published. Um, there's a, a really tear jerking one from a little girl whose father was in the RAF and who'd been killed in battle. And she was describing how writing in her scrapbook was the only way she felt close and connected with her daddy. Uh, but the one I'm going to read to you um, this afternoon is from an American schoolboy. <clears throat> and he says, boys and girls of England, we the pupils of junior high school 45 send you this book. We know that even if England is 3,500 miles away from the United States in distance, it is no more than a few inches from our hearts. The children all over the country want to know you and love you. We want this book to be a sort of Cupid, which is going to begin a lovely friendship between us. We realise the shortage of books in England, and so we want this book to be a permanent part of England. We hope that in return, we will receive a book from you. That would make us happy indeed. <clears throat> For Ward and Lambert and Becker, what they described as mental mobilisation was vital. Ward wrote, Everyone agreed that knitting and rolling bandages was important, but how often do you come across a work party of literates who are determined to wrestle with certain dangerous misconceptions that are causing trouble between one allied people and another? They saw books as the answer in a time when books were scarce. In 1942, Ward wrote that England was experiencing a book famine. She said, at least 20 million books have been destroyed in the burning of libraries and publishing houses. Yet she believed that people were turning to reading as they never did before to escape the strains of war. For Lambert and Becker and Ward, the destruction of books was at the moral heart of the war effort. And books were defense weapons against the enemy's efforts to divide and conquer. Now, a few minutes ago, I mentioned the bomb damage to um, the outpost offices and I was sent a paper very kindly um, about a week ago. And in that paper there was a photograph of um, the library at the Inner Temple in London after a bombing raid. And this just happens to be very close to the American outpost offices. So I suspect they will have also suffered uh, under the same bombing raid. But I think what's interesting here is this could be one of the libraries that Ward is directly talking about. This could be a space that she has actually visited because it was so close to their offices. Lambert and Becker and Ward knew the head of the British Ministry of Information American Division, Mary Agnes Hamilton. The ex-Labour MP for Blackburn, Hamilton had been close to Ramsay MacDonald. She was well connected and endorsed books across the sea, attending their first annual general meeting. The ministry were responsible for publicity and propaganda in wartime, with a remit extending to publicity in Britain and overseas in allied countries, including America. Ward appreciated the support of this government department and kept them informed of Books Across the Sea's achievements and activities, compiling a record of supportive complementary responses she received in return. As Books Across the Sea was a transatlantic organisation, Ward and Lambert and Becker also dealt with the American counterpart of the British Ministry of Information, the Office of War Information in Washington. Similarly charged with imparting information and propaganda at home and overseas, the Office of War Information was supportive of books across the sea and particularly valued its potential post-war role in establishing what was to be a new world order. And Beatrice, as a public relations expert, gathered many of these comments and kept them for future use. And I think this little extract from this list really does emphasize um, the degree of her networking. So the first quote we have is from the director of the Office of War Information, Elma Davis. And we also have one on this list from Brendan Bracken, who was the director of the Ministry of Information in London. Books Across the Sea made up just part of Ward and Lambert and Becker's wartime work. Both maintained their professional interests, 
and also added the establishment of an organization supporting British evacuee children in America and their families, known as the Kinsmen. This organization was founded as a result of an idea from Mrs. Lucy Bemrose, who was the wife of an eminent official from the British Federation of Master Printers, and she had a son who was evacuated to the States. But Beatrice Ward helped Lucy to find found the Kinsmen, and as with Books Across the Sea, the Kinsman had, had an emblem, had a logo, and there's this rather beautiful enamel badge in the Cadbury Research Library showing you what that motif was for the Kinsman Trust. So what we have here is Lady Liberty split from head to toe, and she has been melded to um, Britannia, also split from head to toe. And in front of that, that character, we have a British boy with a hoop and a British girl with, with a doll. And this was a motif that they used in their, their publicity material for the Kinsmen. Also between 1941 and 1944, Beatrice made 25 radio broadcasts across America for the British War Relief Society, and she also lectured for them as well. So these um, broadcasts were really a reflection of her campaigning, her anti-fascist beliefs. Some of the broadcasts were dramatised versions of her war diaries, which she regularly sent to her mother, and which were published um, as bombed but unbeaten by the typophiles, who were a group of typographic enthusiasts in, in New York. Um, Ward also at this time helped to organise um, and open an exhibition of burnt and bomb damaged books from London. And this exhibition took place in the Library of Congress in Washington DC. Beatrice Ward opened the exhibition. She wrote um, many of the captions and she helped to select um, the books, the burnt books, the artifacts for the show. And at the same time, she was helping to establish and run the New York and Boston circles of books across the sea. And additionally, she became involved with British American Canadian Associates, an organisation which supported educational links through cultural exchanges. And ultimately, um, they um, also uh, gave out Fulbright scholarships um, in Britain too. The work of this organisation continued until it was disbanded in the 1990s and they would have really quite sizeable fundraising balls every year and they would have the likes of the band of the Coldstream Guards coming to play. They would have very eminent individuals including royalty attending these events and a lot of the individuals that supported that organisation were also um, volunteers supporting and helping to run books across the sea. Books Across the Sea, together with Ward and Lambert and Becker's aims to promote cultural understanding, um, continued at the end of the war. The American outpost ceased um, at the end of the war, but Books Across the Sea uh, moved to become part of the English speaking union. And one of the great challenges at the end of the war was finding a new reading room where their collection. Um, uh, by 1945 was incredibly sizable where their collection in Britain um, could be housed. So the London Circle had over 2,750 books by um, 1945 and the New York Circle over 2,000. And the reading room that they were lucky enough to find was in South Audley Street Library in Mayfair. And this is a picture of their reading room and it has very imposing crenellated fireplace with Beatrice Ward in a hat standing in front of it with some of her colleagues from Books Across the Sea. And it was opened in 1946 by the mayor, um, but I think the mayor was very much overshadowed by um, an additional um, visiting guest, and that was Eleanor Roosevelt, who was connected to May Lambert and Becker and to Beatrice Ward. And Eleanor Roosevelt came to speak at the opening of this event and Beatrice escorted her and has written quite a comprehensive um, account of that event. And 
Eleanor Roosevelt, one of the things she said at this, this opening was, we can't all travel to see for ourselves, but at least let's read about each other. And I think Beatrice and May Lambert and Becker were connected with Roosevelt through their work for the Kinsmen because Roosevelt also was involved in work with evacuees during wartime. Um, by 1978, so I'm, I'm whizzing forward here because um, by 1978, Beatrice Ward had, not, had died nine years previous to this, but by 1978, Books Across the Sea within um, the English speaking union had 160 branches worldwide and it had 70,000 members. So it had continued, it had grown. And before her death, Beatrice and her friends who had run the organization during wartime were still closely involved with its running and its organization. But I suspect some of you are wondering why if you know anything about Beatrice Ward, you might not have heard very much about her endeavours with Books Across the Sea and her founding of this organisation. And, and to answer that question, which I'm certain you would ask, this all relates to the circumstances of her death. She died tragically in um, September 1969. It was totally unexpected. She had planned to write her memoirs. She was planning to establish um, uh, an archive that included many of her documents, but she died unexpectedly. Her will wasn't kept up to date. So this ambition to establish the archive and to write her memoirs was unfulfilled. And sadly, as a result, um, there has been little known about books across the sea until now, because in 2010, the Cadbury Research Library at Birmingham University was gifted the Ward Collection, which now includes a sizable amount of information on books across the sea. And it's where most of the information that I've been discussing this afternoon has come from. And just to kind of show you the reading room as it is today, it's no longer connected um, to books across the sea. But if any of you are interested in locations connected with, with Beatrice Ward, today the South Audley Street Library is the Marlebone Room and you can get married or you can have a civil partnership um, in this particular room with exactly the same fireplace. So I hope you found um, this afternoon's um, presentation of interest and I am going to kind of hand us back to Depesha so that we can go through any questions or comments that there might be. I shall just stop sharing screens. Okay, so Depesha, do we have any questions? That was brilliant. That was a brilliant webinar. Thank you, Jessica. I'm just going to have a look into the Q&A um, box just to see if there's any questions. And I can't seem to see any as Ooh, yet. Okay. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to pop them in the Q&A. Or to contact me at the university if people think of any questions um, after this. Ah, so we have one comment. Yeah. Uh, um, fascinating talk. Was there a particular theme or subject area that emerged. I think Beatrice Ward and her mother had a fondness for children's literature and there was quite an extensive um, collection of children's books within Books Across the Sea. Um, so I think that was perhaps one of their favourite areas but the society developed um, specialisms in so many different areas and they established specialist groups of people um, post-war to assess different titles. So um, purely coincidentally, I knew somebody who was, happened to be on the committee that was assessing subjects to do with maths and science. Um, so they had quite a range of subjects that they embraced. Uh, some comments about um, interesting talk. Did she continue her calligraphy? Yes, Beatrice Ward um, had a great fondness for handwriting, for um, decent handwriting. She, did a, she talked a lot in newspaper columns and in her presentations about um, 
good handwriting being a very good way into interest in typography. She enjoyed calligraphy and the Cadbury Research Library has some lovely photographs of her sitting by her fireplace with I imagine a piece of her own calligraphy pinned above her fireplace. Yes, she did continue her own calligraphy. She, she was really interested in that. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you very much for those questions and comments. And as I say, if anybody has any further questions about, about Beatrice Ward and Books Across the Sea, please do contact me through the University of Wolverhampton website.